Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, or good night, depending on from where are you connecting from. It is a pleasure for me to welcome you to this e-poster roundtable on performance evaluation and optimization. My name is uh, Joseph Villa. I'm evaluation officer from the quality management and performance monitoring section, the office of the executive secretary. And I will convene this session together with my colleague, Andreas Vins, maintenance engineer from the IMS division. This session is going to deal with three topics of theme four, performance evaluation and monitoring and modeling of the full verification system and its components, IT power systems and other enabling technologies, and network sustainability. We have scheduled 15 presentations, short presentations, maximum two minutes, and we have a very strict time window of 50 minutes. First, we are going to listen to all the contributions and we encourage you to ask questions through the chat. We aim to give the floor to all participants at the end of the presentations uh, to provide the opportunity to the authors to answer. If this were not the case, we're going to do our best to redirect the questions in order that you could have the answers. So without any further delay, we can start with the first uh, presentation. First one is by uh, Noriyuki Kushida, and the title is Comparing the Performance of a Bayesian Automatic Waveform Event Associator, NetVisa, with the Current Operational Approach Global Association at CTBTO, Minimum Detectability Maps for Simulated Explosions. Noriyuki, you have the floor. Can you hear me now? Thank you. Okay, I'm sorry. I unshare the screen. And I hope that you can see my screen now. Yes, we can see. Please okay. proceed. Yeah, uh, the chairman already introduced my title of the presentation and I will skip this one. And this is the uh, motivation of our research. Um, probably, as you know, that we IDC, CDBDO IDC has been developing NetVisa, which is a next generation automatic seismic hydroacoustic infrasound event detector. So far, uh, we have had a lot of testing, and we have some confidence that the NetVisa works better, quite well, probably better than GA, the current operational automatic event detector. But the question is, if we can detect the nuclear explosion really probably in a severe situation, for example, if the DPLK conducted a nuclear explosion testing during the Tohoku event, something like that. Um, this research cannot answer the question directly, but we try to uh, show some evidence that we can do. Um, the method is that we draw the minimum detectable magnitude map of the SHI event detectors. That means that uh, this is the plots you have in the bottom of the screen is really the minimum detectable magnitude map of GA and NetWizard. And this plot shows that the Look, uh, magnitude of the events which can be detected at each location. So as clearly you can see that NetVisa uh, shows better performance than GA. Um, I, if I have time, I wanna uh, speak a bit more about the result. And the minimum detector, sorry, uh, to draw this minimum detectable magnitude map, we use the Noriyuki, sensor. Noriyuki, uh, yeah. please, we can only really ask you to, uh, let's say, shorten the presentation because we have a very tight time window. Okay, then I will stop now. And finish. What is yeah. finish the sentence? <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Noriyuki. Uh, as, as we said, uh, we are going just to give the floor to all uh, presenters. And uh, please feel free to share the screen, but uh, please do not plot videos 
because this can have uh, problems. Some people may not receive the good signal or miss the voice. This is something I forgot to mention. And uh, please keep this in mind. Share the screen, but not not play videos. So going to the second uh, presentation, the second presentation will be delivered by or short presentation, Thibault Arnal, and the title is IPC SHI Reengineering Alpha Tester Group. Thibault, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Joseph. Uh, welcome, everybody. Good morning or good afternoon, wherever you are uh, on the planet. So um, the IDC SHI Reengineering Alpha Tester Group, that's a lot of terms and that have to be taken in two parts. Uh, the IDC SHI Reengineering is a project the PTS is leading uh, for since uh, 2014 to create an open, open source modernized and maintainable software for uh, SHI processing. And as you can see on this slide, it's ongoing and we're now in the development and implementation phase. It's based on the geophysical monitoring system developed by the US NDC, and the IDC is uh, adapting this baseline with modifying a bit the baseline, adding IDC specific components and adapting uh, our IDC to the new system. And the Alpha Tester Group is, um, is a project we started that is funded by the European Union, which is intends to allow national data center to participate in the evaluation of the, of the system and to contribute um, to, to improve and adapt it to the, to the needs of the CTBTO and the NDCs. This was uh, just briefly what I wanted to mention that the first testing session happened uh, in April and it was about exploring the web service architecture and validating the initial components we delivered. So if you're interested in the poster, I please go to the to the dedicated page and uh, contact me if you have any question. Thank you very much, Steve Walt, for this presentation and also appreciate the concise and short time you spent. Next presentation is going to be delivered by Svetlana. Uh, good night, Svetlana, or good afternoon. Uh, um, can you share your screen? Are you muted, Svetlana? Do you hear me? Yes. Okay, do you see my screen? Uh, yes, we see. Okay. This is my screen. Okay. Okay. So, so go uh, good morning, good afternoon, good day, everyone. Uh, hello, I'm in Europe this time. Happy to join this. Uh, session on performance evaluation and system testing. My name is Svetlana and this is a joint presentation with Spiros Piliopoulos from Australian NDC. Uh, the aim of this uh, um, presentation and poster is uh, to show uh, to member states and to interested users that uh, SASCOM 3 with NetVis Associator is performing well with non-IMS stations. Uh, I'm uh, inviting you to have a look on the results of our testing. Uh, we have uh, incorporated in the system of SASCOM 3 with NetVis Associator, uh, Australian uh, Seismological Network Broadband Station and stations in China, MDG and uh, TGN in Korea. We have investigated two regions, Australia and North Korea. And here are results of this uh, comparison. Uh, a detailed analysis for one day is also presented in our um, uh, presentation, in our poster, and it performs and it gives uh, even better results. On the next slide, uh, sorry. Uh, I don't know how to move, but the next slide is presenting our results and conclusion. The main uh, conclusion from our uh, testing of the system is that uh, uh, this combination of SASCOM and NetVis Associator is going to be a very useful um, tool for the NDCs. We are urging IDC to take uh, into consideration one of the main uh, recommendations for Alpha Tester Group on um, uh, 
uh, meeting in 2019 and to provide the visualization of the synthetic beams in the system in SESCOM 3. And we are very happy to share our experience with any interested NDC on inclusion on non-IMS non stations in SESCOM with NetVisa uh, Associator. Uh, it is not straightforward, but it is rather easy to be accomplished if you know how. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'm inviting you to see our poster and to send us any questions or to contact us if you are interested in this inclusion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Svetlana. I, my apologies. I think that I did not introduce the title of your presentation, which was Australian NDC testing of the NetBIS application integrated with Site 3. My apologies for that. It's okay. Moving, moving to the next presentation. That will be delivered by uh, Paulina Bittner, and the title is Controlled Underwater Explosions of World War II Ordnances. Paulina, you have the floor. So, hello, I will share my screen now. I hope everything is seen well. Yes, we can. And you, uh, you can hear me, yeah. Yes. So, hello again. Um, uh, this presentation is on controlled underwater explosions of uh, World War II ordnances. Uh, this conflict has finished a uh, long time uh, Paulina, ago. Paulina, uh, yeah, your I voice see. appears low. Can you please uh, try to talk a little bit louder? Yeah, sure. Can I, I can to see the now, uh, I can see now a black screen. Can you still see my slide? No, we also see the, the black screen. So I will stop sharing and try to do something again. Okay, I think. Now, fine. No, can you please try to increase the volume of the, your microphone? Um, is it okay yes, that's now? Perfect. That's perfect. Yeah, Thank okay. You. Uh, but I still have a problem with my screen. Sorry, this is a live presentation. One can see that <laughs> it worked perfectly well when we were trying. Now we can see it. Nah. Okay. Uh, so uh, this conflict has finished 75 years ago, uh, but uh, one can be surprised that we are still finding uh, explosive materials in Europe. And uh, these materials, of course, have to be removed from the... Okay, I will just say. <laughs> uh, have to be removed from uh, the place where they are and put in the uh, remote locations. Um, then they are destroyed and uh, they, of course, uh, create uh, seismic acoustic events. Uh, we were interested whether this uh, relatively small explosions will be uh, recorded at the IMS stations. And uh, we found three locations in Europe. One was uh, close to Gdańsk, one on the Polish-German border and one uh, offshore France. Uh, what uh, we saw was that we could detect these explosions. Uh, we did not so well in the uh, automatic Bulletins, we could build uh, reviewed events, and we could somehow compare uh, the magnitude of the event with the uh, explosion um, material size. So, uh, please, uh, if you are interested in the results of the study, please uh, look at the poster, uh, and uh, I will be very happy to answer your questions. I'm so sorry that this did not work uh, from the slide side. Thank you very much, Paulina, and thank you very much for the presentation without the slide. Uh, we move forward to the next presentation from uh, Kenny McPherson. From Alaska, I think, minus eight hours. Thank you very much for the effort in joining this session. And the title is Quality Control of Heterogeneous IMS Stations. You have the floor. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks very much for convening this session. Uh, great talk so far, and, and this is a really interesting session. 
Uh, I'm assuming everyone can see my screen okay? Yes, everything is okay. Please, you can proceed. Thanks. I, I'm from the Wilson Alaska Technical Center at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. And uh, what I'd like to share with you today is the work we've done implementing a quality <laughs> control system uh, at the Wilson Alaska Technical Center. Uh, and what we found as we were doing this is as we were kind of shopping around for existing solutions is that many of the softwares that are out there, uh, such as the Iris Mustang or Ice Pack software are heavily oriented towards seismic. And that didn't work well for us because we really curate a diversity of channel types uh, that include broadband seismic, uh, short period seismic, as well as infra infrasound and auxiliary environmental channels. And so a solution like ice pack wouldn't do everything that we wanted to do. So we built our solution around the ice pack, uh, which is a great software for seismology that we kind of built it out to be able to deal with this diversity in channel types. And one of the ways we did that was by leveraging the OBSPI Python toolbox, which is a very flexible software and they also entertain pull requests. And so we were able to build in some customization that we needed at the center. Uh, chiefly, one of the things that we implemented was uh, infrasound special handling in the OBSPI toolbox. Uh, so if you're an OBSPI user and you, you deal with infrasound, uh, this is in the main branch of the software now. So I, I encourage you to, to check it out. And you can do things like you can display uh, power prob probability density functions of, of power spectral densities and the response removal is handled properly and you can display those spectra alongside um, the IDC global ambient noise model. Uh, there, there's lots in the poster. I, I encourage you to take a look at it. Uh, we also built some custom metrics that's useful for infrasound. Uh, something that we call array RMS, which is just a simple metric that uh, can compares RMS at a single infrasound channel uh, to the average of the array and is designed to detect uh, transients on a single channel. And there's an example of that here. Uh, this slide is just examples of the system detecting uh, data defects. Uh, on the left here is uh, uh, spectral analysis. Yeah, kind of running out of time. <laughs> yes. All, all right. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, please ha have a look at our poster if you're interested, and I I'd love to hear questions from you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, as we said, we are short in time. We're going to move uh, from Alaska to Italy. Damiano Pesaresi is the next speaker. And the presentation is the Italian CTBTO Cooperating National Facility Readiness Status. Buongiorno, Damiano, please proceed. You are mute, Damiano. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, thank you very much, Joseph. Uh, so, my name is Damiano. I'm working for the National Institute of Oceanography and Applied Geophysics in the northeast of Italy. But I've been working also for CTBTO as an MS officer. So our presentation is about the Italian Cooperating National Facility. What, what's a Cooperating National Facility? It's a, an extra station, if you wish, that a state party may wish to a, a, a share with the CTBTO, mainly for on-site inspections uh, purposes. So I will uh, talk a little bit about our experience in uh, offering one of our seismic stations as a National Cooperating Facility. So, it's not working, but I don't understand why. No worries, Damiano. Okay, uh, I will just talk it's because it's not moving. Yes, please. Uh, so, yes. um, mainly we decided to, uh, to, to use the seismic station as it is and not to buy a special equipment. But of course, we had to provide uh, uh, the station standard station interface that the PTS is providing for uh, connecting uh, the station to their system. So mainly we had to uh, use the CD1 protocol and to use authentication. So we bought the equipment that the um, 
PTS suggested, which was a small computer, and that was very fine. But that meant some problems in uh, installing the operating system because the standard station interface of the CTBTO requires a CentOS 6 operating system, which is quite old. And we had problem in installing this old software. But then again, with the help of the PTS, we installed it in this, and we were able to configure the standard station interface, which actually now is up and running and sending live CD1 data authenticated to the CTBTO. What else? We had to buy uh, extra batteries to provide 14 days of um, uninterrupted data to the CTBTO. We had to in, in increase security, so the, we install a fence on the station, and we we will install a tam anti tamper device, which again will be connected to the CTBTO, and um, and then again authentication it's uh, it provided with the system. So uh, at the moment the station is up and running. We are only missing two items for the formal step of uh, certification of the station. One is the uh, is uh, the calibration, automatic calibration from the city below our station. So, so far so good. Uh, we hope that by the end of the year, we will be able to provide a cooperation national facility to the CTO. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. Sorry for my presentation, but if you have any questions, I'm here to answer. Thank you. Thank you, Damiano, for this improvisation. So, we're going to move now to the next presentation is delivered uh, by Christos Saragiotis, and the title is Tuning the IMS Seismic Stations by Optimizing Their Detection Thresholds. Please, Christos, proceed. Christos, can you hear us? I don't think he's in the meeting. Well, it seems probably he will join us later in any case, so just not to, to spend time waiting, we are going to go to the next one. The next one is going to be delivered by Anne Tipka, and the title is Investigation of Improvement Possibilities for Source Localization Using High Resolution Atmospheric Transport Modeling Within the Framework of the CTBT, Application to Shannon 133 Observations. Anne, you can proceed. Yeah, thank you. Can you see my screen now? Yes, we can. Perfect. So, good morning, everybody. And uh, with this e post, I want to give an overview of the current status of my case study. We evaluate the use of high resolution research as we're going to the frame of the city video. Do you hear also this strange noise, or is it just me? Ah. Thank you. Excuse me, um, Excuse me. I guess... the applause, uh, and uh, Christos, we saw you just connected. Uh, we're going to give you the floor after this presentation. Okay. Please, Anne, um, I guess everybody knows that we use the ATM at, uh, to assist in localized potential source regions. After our MS stations uh, measured and evaluated radioactive substances. And currently, we do this operationally with uh, one hour input data from ECMWF and NCEP at 0 0.5 degree spatial resolution. And um, we started to investigate the high resolution ATM a while ago by using the model combination of WARF and Flexbot WARF, by using the WARF as a step in between to increase the spatial resolution even higher than, for example, to up to 0 0.1 degree or one kilometer. And to evaluate this effectiveness, we use Xenon 133 stack emission data from the medical isotope production IRE in Belgium and measurements from the IMS station shower and lands uh, because it has a very complex mountainy area. And we started with the setup recommended by the community for this kind of area and selected the domain setup, which allowed us to compare it directly to the operational ATM results. We did this for now with uh, 0 0.5 degree and 0 0.1 degree due to, yeah, of course, um, high computational demand. And the study is still in progress. So we will continue as the resources allow us to. And I can show you some preliminary results in this um, e poster. And I wanted to show you 
actually a video, which I shouldn't. So please go to my presentation in the system. And if you're not able to view it, just contact me directly. Um, I can show just some pretty. Uh, and, uh, and I'm afraid uh, we have not time for this. Um, uh, we appreciate your uh, willingness to answer questions. And if uh, you have the presentation of lot of people will for sure come back to you if they have questions. Just conclude. Thank you. Thank you. Please, very quick. So, what is it? Stops. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. So, uh, we saw that Christos uh, is now live and it was uh, the previous presentations. So, Christos Saragiotis is going to deliver the next uh, short speech, short and titled Tuning the IMS Seismic Stations by Optimizing Their Detection Thresholds. You have the floor, Christos. Are you muted, Christos? We cannot hear you. Okay, sorry about that. Um, it's okay. I mute myself because I was creating this strange noise before. So let me just uh, share this presentation. Is it shared now? Yes, it's shared. Please, you it's can proceed. Shared. Okay. Okay. So, um, so uh, apologies for the delay. I had some issues connecting. Uh, this is some work I did with my colleague here, the CBTO Ivan Kitov, to uh, to to tune the de beam detection thresholds for the primary array stations. Um, the criteria that we used for this uh, for this tuning was the association rate and the miss rate or added phases rate. So the association rate is the percentage of uh, detections that are actually associated to the final product, the RB, and the miss rate is the percentage of uh, uh, associated phases that uh, had to be manually added by the analyst because they were missed by the um, detection uh, by the detector. So this is you can see here maybe in the middle uh, bottom uh, figure. Uh, this is the target area. So this is the um, sorry. So maybe I should show here. This is the target area. So this is uh, but the association rate should be more than ten percent. And uh, this is the target area for the uh, for the added phases rate or miss rate, which is, should be less than 20%. So this is the actual target area, and this is how the system works now. So it is completely off the target area. Uh, association is quite good, but the uh, added uh, added rate is is pretty bad. So what we did is we followed the procedure which is described in the IDC processing manual, but this this had very limited success. Uh, the problem is is very difficult because it has a lot of parameters that have to be uh, determined. So for every beam, and typically every station would have something like uh, 20 beams, we would have to, to find different thresholds. Uh, so then what we did was a hybrid uh, grid search and uh, genetic algorithm optimization, and we found some uh, some good results. So we, we will be uh, proposing some uh, tuning for uh, some of the stations, but not for all of them. And the reason is that for some stations, we were not able to, to tune them in the target area. But we realized that the problem for this is mostly that uh, there's an artificial reason for this. And this is that the analysts, uh, when they do their uh, interactive review, they might add phases that have so low SNR that it's impossible to be, um, it is, these phases are impossible to be detected by any detector. So this uh, this causes uh, a problem to the to this performance metrics, and we will uh, later see how we will deal with this. So please visit the uh, the poster, and if you have any questions, I would be happy to answer. Thank you very much, uh, Christos, for the presentation. So we are going now to jump to the second topic of the theme, which is IT power systems and other enabling technologies. And the first presentation is going to be delivered by Pavel Martisovic. And the title is IMS Guidelines, Minimum Standards for Grounding and Lining Protection System at the IMS Stations, Standard Content, Implementation, and its Influence on Data Availability Statistics. Pavel, you have the floor, and please try to be concise. Good 
morning. Do you see my presentation now? Yes. Uh, now, yes, please. Yeah. Uh, good morning, dear colleagues. Today, I would like to present our e-poster showing details of IMS guidelines for minimum standards for grounding and winter protection system at the IMS stations, as well as status and results of its implementation in the network. The standard has been developed by IMS AD in cooperation with Austrian Electrotechnical Associations, so-called OVA. The standard is comprehensive, a comprehensive document covering design and construction of lightning and surge protection system at all IMS facilities. Up to today, the standard has been implemented at more than 20 stations. The document is periodically revised in order to reflect recent development in lightning and surge protection area and the corresponding standards. The second part of the poster shows implementation progress and statistical trends, which we believe are affected by upgrades of the lightning and surge protection systems. So that's all from my side. Uh, I will appreciate your feedback and uh, don't hesitate to ask the questions about this document. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Pavel, for this concise uh, presentation. And we are moving to move now to the next one that will be delivered by Mario Zampoli. And the title is Safeguarding Data Availability at IMS Hydroacoustic Hydrophone Stations by Improving Onshore Digital Data Handling Equipment. Mario, please proceed. Thank you, Ozep. Uh, I am just about to share the screen. Uh, so, um, yes, you can. Very see. quickly, this, um, uh, this presentation is co-authored with uh, my colleagues, Jay Stanley, Yogo Sarabus, Mokta, Muni Kunce, and uh, contractors, Manuel Hojewski from Zuke, who work on the SSI system, and Jeff Genevieve, Peter Jorgensen, Doug Bolton. Uh, uh, Mario, please, uh, I would like to request uh, attendees if they can mute the microphone just to avoid interferences. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And Guy Chakara from L3 Harris Maripro, which is the company that builds our underwater systems and uh, a, a good part also of the electronics that you see in this image here that is on the shore. So the data from the hydroacoustic stations comes from underwater, digital data, upper fiber optic cable to this system here, which is provided by Maripro, which is a digital data formatting interface that gives a GPS timestamp, merges it with state of health data, and passes it all on to the commission's SSI computers, which are quite the same basically as the ones that are used in the other technologies, in the, um, in the other waveform technologies. And these computers send everything on in CD 1.1 format to uh, the IDC via the satellite link. Now, uh, we all know that the SSI computers have the capability to backfill from their internal buffer when uh, something has happened beyond this point going out that prevents the data from being sent uh, to Vienna. But there are a number of failure modes where either in the SSI, when the SSI is sent out and the data nevertheless does not arrive, that, uh, that, that can potentially lead to data loss. And in the hydro stations, which have a very high data availability, um, are those residual failure modes that, of the shore equipment, which have led to some instances of all the data loss in the past. And for this, we have developed a project with MariPro um, to uh, in, build a, a buffer inside the DDFI, which is an additional buffer that stores all the data, all the diagnostics of the system, and, um, and to make that buffer accessible for backfill, additional backfill on demand from the SSI, and also for enhanced diagnostics. This will allow, for example, the state, the operator from Vienna, even, or from the National Data Center to log in remotely and see all the diagnostic data also that is on the DDFI as if you were at the station. So these developments have been uh, conducted last year, all remotely, obviously, uh, before the crisis. You can put in short. Yes. And, um, and they have been uh, implemented also. Uh, and indeed, this is something that's not in the poster, so I'm just announcing it here. 
last week, uh, Geoscience Australia, Craig Bugden and team were down at HL1 Cape Bluin. They installed uh, these new features. We tested them with remote support from here and they all turned out to work beautifully. So we're very excited that we have rolled out these new capabilities to the field. And uh, we are just uh, ready now to start working on rolling out these capabilities also at HA03 and HA04 in the coming year, hopefully. Uh, and uh, so we expect that this will further increase the sustainability and safeguard the data availability of hydro stations. More details in the poster. Thank you. Thank you, Mario. So without delay, we are going to move to the next one, uh, uh, delivered by Klaus Johansson. And the title is Challenges and Improvements to DC Power Systems at IMS Waveform Stations. Uh, Klaus, uh, please, floor is yours. Yes, thank you. I'll keep it very shortly. This is a small presentation of, um, of some of the DC power systems we have at many uh, or most of the waveform sites with multiple uh, subsites or arrays with independent DC subsystems. And it's a, a walkthroughs of some of the issues we found over uh, 10 plus 10 years of, uh, of, uh, of station life. Um, so anything from poor connections to heavy corrosion and, and et cetera. And a few examples of how this can be uh, uh, repaired or partially upgraded with, with new equipment, with new technology that makes it uh, a little bit better to at least maintain and, and keep, uh, uh, keep running. So, uh, so we're ensuring uh, data coming to, the, to Vienna. That's the very short version. Thank you. Thank you very much, Klaus, for this concise uh, presentation. The next one, uh, we are going to jump plus six hours Vienna uh, to uh, China, and uh, it's going to be delivered by uh, Jian Li, and the title is CTBTO Equipment Smart Management Solution Based on Radio Frequency Identification. Jali, you have the floor. Maybe we have a problem with the connection. Can inform that he's not here. Just not to waste time, we're going to put this one in standby and we're going to move to the next one. The next one is from uh, Christian Garita. Um, which, uh, Christian, are you live? I will also put this one in standby, so uh, in case uh, they uh, join us, they will be given the floor. So then we are going to move to the third topic of this theme, which is uh, network sustainability and systems engineering for CTVT verification. And we're going to jump to minus eight hours with respect to Vienna. The first speaker is uh, James Mark Harris. And the title is Station State of Health Monitoring with the Geophysical Monitoring System. Uh, James, you have the floor and thank you for joining us at such an uh, unusual time. Well, it seems that there, uh, there is another presentation that is not here at this point that everything was uh, all were contacted, but it seems that the connection is not for some whatever reason. We have another presentation uh, from Reynold Suarez. Uh, Reynold, is you, are you live? Yes. Okay, thanks. Uh, um, so it's minus nine hours, I think, in your case, with respect to Vienna. So thank you very much for joining us at the series of time. Uh, as I said, the author is uh, Reno Suarez, and the title of the presentation is Using Data Science for Predictive Maintenance of Novel Gas System Within the IMS. Reno, you have the floor. Thank you. Yeah, um, so, so I'll be short. Um, so what we're, what we're doing here is, is um, we're using uh, advanced data science techniques and looking at monitoring uh, radionuclide systems, uh, 
radiant light systems in the IMS are fairly complex, have lots of sensors associated with them, and they're known, uh, you know, that they fail. And, and right now we're good at failing uh, in terms of diagnostics and detecting failures. What we're trying to do now is move into detecting when failures are going to occur or pre predict them. Um, and so th there are uh, several techniques uh, that you can use to do this. Uh, what we're using right now is a data driven approach um, where you actually monitor, look at the sensors uh, and the data coming in and a physics based approach uh, where you actually are able to model, model the systems. Um, and uh, we were really actually looking at several techniques, a lot of data science, uh, AI ML type techniques. And one that we've been looking at a little closer is uh, long short term memory because it's good for classification and making predictions with uh, time series data. And some uh, results uh, have been uh, fairly promising. Um, they've been we've been able to model the data well, and um, even in the case of of a known failure, uh, we're starting to see that we can see some features uh, ahead of the time when we actually detected the failure. So we're continuing to look at that. Um, and moving forward, we are just looking at continuing to extend the uh, prediction window um, and um, implement the algorithms into our actual tools for we have for state health monitoring and perform some classification analysis and then look for gaps in data and sensors to actually fill those gaps. And that's currently where we're at. And I just want to acknowledge the uh, nuclear uh, national, uh, national nuclear security administration for, for this uh, office of uh, nuclear verification for this uh, funding this work. And that would be my. Thank you very much. Ray. Um, we have, uh, this is the last presentation. We have still three in standby that we will give them the floor. So this give us a few minutes if there is any question and we can give the floor to the author. Uh, if anyone uh, wishes to ask a particular question or one of the authors a very, very short clarification, we have uh, five minutes for this, please. Raise your hand. Seems is not the case. Um, I would like to uh, thank all of you. Um, Noriyuki, are you still alive? Yes, I'm here. Okay. So, since you asked for just if we could have one more minute to explain something related to your presentation, uh, if you are ready, we can give you that minute. Okay. I think I'm sharing the screen. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, we, this is a more detailed result that I showed in the previous slide. Um, actually, the what we did to draw this minimum detectable magnitude map is to synthesize the event on the computer, actually, and uh, on each grid point and each magnitude and check if NetOvis and GA can detect such synthesized event. And synthesizing, synthesizing event depends on the probabilistic model. So the results should be also probabilistic. Um, in such a case that uh, we realized that the NetOvis and GA has have almost the same performance when we only need a low detectability chance. But if we really need to have a higher chance of detectability, then uh, NetVisa really uh, performs much better than GA. And also we uh, confirmed that the result resembles the trend of the threshold monitoring map. This uh, basically shows the uh, detectability of signals of each station. So we have some confidence that we are on the right track to do this minimum detectable magnitude map. Thank you. I think that's all for today. And if Thank you, you have- much. Thank you very much, Ryuki. Thank you. And, uh... 
Uh, we also shortly repeat the presentation as per my notes of uh, Mr. Kenneth McPherson from Alaska. Uh, maybe you can have now one minute if you have something else to add to your presentation. Thank you for that. Um, Oh, sorry, I, I lost you there for a second. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll pull my slide back up. We can see your screen. Please, please proceed. Have one oh, minute. Great. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just jump um, almost to the end again with just some examples of uh, data defects that, that we've been catching uh, with the system we set up. Uh, here in the left column, uh, a spectral analysis was showing that we were consistently ab above the, the kind of pa Peterson ambient noise model for seismic channels. And we, we were able to identify this as a metadata response issue uh, based on those metrics, and, and we were able to fix that. Uh, in the middle column is an example of one of our weather stations that we're unable to do a spectral analysis, but by just looking at the sample unique metric, which shows the number of unique samples in the waveform for a single day, uh, based on the very low number of samples, we were able to identify this as a dead sensor and replace it. And on, on the right column here is an example of the array RMS kind of custom metric that we designed for detecting transients on infrasound channels, uh, actually identifying a site visit uh, where it detected this transient uh, at, at each um, element of an array. Uh, so these are just some examples of, of some defects that we've been catching with the system. And we also implemented a reporting system that consists of a, a detailed HTML report that we share with our quality assurance team so they, they can go out and actually address uh, these data defects that we catch. And we also summarize our, our data quality uh, by using this data quality uh, index that we derive for each channel. That, that's just a, a product of, of several of the metrics that we compute. Um, and, and the reason we spent a lot of time on this is, um, you know, data quality is great, but if you if you don't tell the people that can actually fix the problems, then, then it's useless. Uh, so we do spend a lot of time in, in reporting and, and kind of summarizing this information. Um, yeah, so thanks for the extra time. And, and again, I encourage you to have a look at our poster and, and um, send any questions my way. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have been uh, noticing that there is activity in the chat, in the chat uh, through, uh, through WebEx. And uh, but uh, we have just received uh, and those uh, questions. We also saw that uh, have been answered by the people that presented uh, the speech. We have received uh, questions here uh, to uh, Noriyuki, and the question is um, is a question to Noriyuki on performance of NetVisa. Why there is so many events detected by NetVisa in Southern Hemisphere? compared to global association? Oh, well, um, I cannot answer right now, but he, pro just probably because the it has a better, I don't know, <laughs> probably <laughs> negative. Worries. <laughs> we will put you in contact with the person that asked that question and should they will provide the right clarifications. It's difficult to answer now, yet uh, through the life. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think that's better. Okay, we have uh, two more minutes. If there is any other question from the attendees of this round table. Well, if it is not the case, uh, we can conclude this round table. I wish to thank all the presenters that uh, 
according to the information I gathered yesterday, covers a difference of 17 time fuses. So when I said the beginning, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, or probably good night, good things that all work during the same day from 00, zero to 6 in the afternoon. Thank you very much, dear colleagues, for your contributions, and thank you very much for having contributed to Science and Technology 2021. Uh, Thanks again, and I wish you a very nice weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Likewise, have a nice weekend. Thank you. Yeah.